on the 1st of May 1915, the RMS Lusitania set sail from New York bound for Liverpool in the UK. World War I had been in progress for just under a year, and tensions were high all over the world. But despite this atmosphere of uncertainty, nobody who sailed on board the Lusitania could have guessed that their voyage would be violently cut short in the waters off the coast of Ireland, in an incident that would come to be a turning point in the history of the First World War. At the turn of the 20th century, there was a great rivalry in the ocean liner industry. Germany was producing fast, luxurious ships in response to the growing number of people sailing to America from Europe. In 1899, the German ship Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross had been awarded the coveted Blue Ribbon Award for the fastest crossing of the Atlantic, which was the first time Britain had lost the record. In a bid to stay competitive, British shipping giant Cunard made a deal with the government of the UK, whereby the government helped finance the construction and operation of two brand new passenger liners, the Lusitania and the Mauritania. There was just one condition. Should war break out, the ships would be made available to the government for use as auxiliary cruisers. The Lusitania was a very impressive ship. The interior was designed by Scottish architect James Miller, with an emphasis on luxury and scale. There were six decks to accommodate passengers, two of which were dedicated entirely to first-class travellers, and which more closely resembled a luxury hotel than a ship. Electric lighting, elevators, ensuite facilities, and heating, as well as decor featuring Corinthian columns, mahogany panels, and stained glass windows, all contributed to the incredible decadence of the ship. At the same time, to fulfil the obligation to the British government, a secret compartment was also installed to allow the transportation of arms and ammunition, should war be declared. When the ship set off for her maiden voyage in 1907, a crowd of 200,000 people gathered in Liverpool to witness her departure. It was seen as a huge achievement, not just for Cunard, but for Great Britain. On her second voyage, she was awarded the Blue Riband, and she and her sister ship, the Mauritania, continually competed for the honour in the years that followed. When the First World War broke out in 1914, the Lusitania was added to the official list of armed merchant cruisers by the British Admiralty. However, she wasn't armed, and in fact continued to operate as a commercial liner. Demand for crossing the Atlantic had dwindled, but there was still enough to justify keeping her in service. Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty at the time, was also keen for the ship to keep running saying that it was most important to attract neutral shipping to our shores, in the hope especially of embroiling the USA with Germany. For our part, we want the traffic. The more the better. And if some of it gets into trouble, better still. In early 1915, the emergence of German U-boats brought fresh danger. Desperate to gain an advantage wherever they could, and in response to the Royal Navy blockade of Germany, the Germans declared that the seas around Great Britain and Ireland were now a war zone, and ships in the area would be sunk without warning. Though, of course, efforts would be taken to avoid sinking neutral ships. The German embassy in America, fearing backlash should a passenger ship be sunk, took out large adverts in many US newspapers, which read... Travellers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies, and Great Britain and her allies. That the zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles, that, in accordance with formal notice given by the Imperial German government, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain, or any of her allies, are liable to destruction in those waters, and that travellers sailing in the war zone on ships of Great Britain or her allies, do so at their own risk. Some papers even published the warning next to advertisements for the Lusitania. Despite these warnings, 1,266 passengers and 696 crew were on board the Lusitania as it left Pier 54 in New York on the 1st of May 1915, her 202nd crossing of the Atlantic. 
For the most part, it was a tense but routine voyage. By the 7th of May, she had almost reached her destination. She was sailing adjacent to the south coast of Ireland, around 18 kilometres, or 11 miles, off the old head of Kinsale. It was at this point that she was sighted by the U-20 German U-boat, under the command of Captain Walter Schweiger. Just two days earlier, the U-20 had stopped a merchant schooner in the same area. On that occasion, they had examined the ship's papers, and ordered the crew to disembark before sinking the vessel with gunfire. This time, however, they fired without warning. A single torpedo cut its way through a calm sea towards the Lusitania. Some of the passengers and crew on deck spotted a line of bubbles speeding towards them, and just had time to cry out in alarm before, with a shuddering crash, the torpedo struck the Lusitania on the starboard bow. The explosion of the torpedo was followed moments later by a secondary explosion from somewhere within the ship, which lurched swiftly to one side. Inventor Robert Rankin was on board, and he later recalled, The explosion came with a terrific crash, clear through the five decks destroying the boiler room and the main steam pipe. A mass of glass, wood, etc. came pouring on our heads, 200 feet aft. We ducked into the smoking room shelter, and I never saw my companions again. The crew desperately attempted to launch lifeboats, but found that due to the ship's severe list it was nearly impossible. On one side, lifeboats swung away from the deck, making it difficult to load passengers, while on the other, the list caused them to swing inwards, preventing them from being launched at all. Lifeboats overturned as they were lowered, spilling passengers into the sea, and at least one lifeboat crashed down on top of an already launched one, crushing the people inside. Of 48 lifeboats available, only six were successfully launched. One passenger, Chrissy Aitken, was able to get on board a lifeboat. She later recalled, We had 40 in our boat. I was next afraid maybe we would capsize with so many, but we didn't. It was a sight I'll never forget, passing people who are crying for help and not able to help or save them. Just before 2.30pm, less than 20 minutes after the torpedo was fired, the ship disappeared under the water. Nine vessels sped from the coast of Ireland to rescue survivors, but the sinking had been swift, chaotic and brutal. Despite the quick response, 1,195 people had died. The majority were British citizens. 128 were Americans. The sinking was followed by an international outcry. Germany defended the actions of its military by stating that the Lusitania was classed as an auxiliary cruiser, and therefore a legitimate target. This did little to quell the sense of injustice felt around the world, particularly in America. President Woodrow Wilson was under pressure to declare war immediately, but his goal had always been to negotiate an end to the war, not join it. He insisted that the Germans apologised for the sinking, but an apology was not forthcoming. The German Grand Admiral, Alfred von Tirpitz, claimed that the Lusitania was an armed cruiser, heavily laden with munitions. The Lusitania hadn't been armed, though she certainly had been carrying munitions in her secret compartment. The British government made the decision not to advertise this fact. The public outcry over the sinking could be invaluable to the war effort. Admitting that the Lusitania was transporting weapons would have complicated the matter. The US was not ready for war in early 1915 but the sinking of the Lusitania set a clear path for them to join the Allies in 1917. Germany would backtrack on their submarine policy later in 1915, only attacking ships that they knew were British, and refraining from any attacks on passenger liners at all. However, when they resumed unrestricted submarine warfare in January 1917, it was a significant factor in persuading the US to join the First World War. Churchill later said, In spite of all its horror, 
we must regard the sinking of the Lusitania as an event most important and favourable to the Allies. The poor babies who perished in the ocean struck a blow at German power more deadly than could have been achieved by the sacrifice of a hundred thousand fighting men. Though they did not know it at the time, those who perished in the sinking of the Lusitania would be a vital part of the history of World War I. Memorials to them exist in several places, including in Liverpool in the UK and Cobb in Ireland, where survivors were brought ashore. The loss of so many lives would be just one of many worsening atrocities throughout the war, but one that, at the very least, began to turn the tide.